estate planning attorney, but really what I like to say my firm specializes in is family wealth planning. Um, we take a holistic approach to make sure not only the legal documents are in order, but also the financial side um, and the personal side. We really like to be the family attorney and we ensure again that both if your finances aren't in order, your legal documents need to both work together. And so we focus on that. Um, an estate plan in general is many, many documents. It's several documents. But today, because of time, I'm really going to focus on a trust and a particular kind of trust called a revocable living trust. <clears throat> what is a trust and what is a revocable living trust? Some people call it just a living trust, some people call it a trust, but essentially it's just a contract or a piece of paper where you are putting your stuff in and you say what you want <clears throat> and where you want the stuff to go. And while you're living, it's really life goes on very normally. I tell my clients, you put your trust and your estate planning documents in place, you set them, forget them. Okay, but then they come up when you need them and you're protected against many different things. Um, I'm going to focus on today uh, the benefits of having a revocable living trust. Um, they're listed on, on this paper here. Um, I'm going to try and hit all of them, but I'm going to focus on a few. Yes, there's some loose sleep ones over there. Okay, and there's some at the end. Okay, thank you. How many of you have um, worked on a probate sale? How many of you had fun working on that probate sale? A few. A, few. Um, a revocable living trust will avoid probate. One of the main things you want to do in life in general is stay out of court. Okay? Actually avoid probate with a shortened petition. And I got the motion granted. And I get on the steps of the downtown courthouse, and there's a lot of steps going down, and they're like hard marble stone. And I take two steps, and I just fall. I just eat it. I'm on my face. My nylons are torn. I'm having homeless people help try and pick me up and put me together. And I said, Oh my gosh, I need to stay out of court forever as long as I possibly can. So that's what I try and help my clients do. Probate is a court process that if you own real estate in California or assets over $100,000. You're going to need to go through this court process in order to get your assets to your beneficiaries. The problem is it's a lengthy process. You'll be lucky if you finish within a year. I highly doubt that. Uh, it's expensive. You'll see on the second page of this handout are the fees listed. And basically, essentially, if you have about a million dollar state, so that in Southern California could be just a residence and a few other accounts, you're looking at attorney's fees, just a loan, of over $20,000. And those are set fees. I can't cut you a break. They're set by court. And um, even if it's one asset, those will be the fees. And the fees are calculated on the value of the state, but not less the mortgage on the house. So it's still just the value of the house gets, that gets calculated. So you save your loved ones a lot of time, a lot of money by having this trust in place. Um, Another advantage of having an entire state plan in place, but specifically the trust, is that your assets will be managed um, if you're not able to, if, if there's a period of time where you're incapacitated in any way, uh, someone will be able to step in without again involving the court, and they'll be able to manage your assets. Saves a lot of, again, grief for your loved ones. It avoids confusion. Um, when money gets involved between families, even the best of families, there's always confusion, right? If things aren't in writing and aren't in place, it begins to sound like, oh, no, mom actually really wanted me to have this because I always, I always stayed more with her, she liked me more. So stories change and it, it begins to get confusing on who gets what and uh, how much of what. So having, again, a document in place is going to be very important to help your loved ones avoid that confusion. Um, there is privacy uh, associated with having a living trust rather than having just a will, because a will is not enough, you need a trust, because if you have real estate, we'll be in court. If you just have a will, it's going to be lodged in the court for everyone to see who, what, who your beneficiaries are, who you didn't like and who you wrote out of it. And, um, and you, you're, you're stuck in a very um, you know, public arena, the court. Um, 
I'm going to focus the rest of the time on two very important concepts or benefits of a revocable living trust. Uh, one is tax, tax benefits, because we want, all want to avoid taxes as much as possible. And the second is asset protection. A lot of people put off doing uh, trust or having their estate plan in place because they think, well, what good is it going to do me? It really just benefits my kids and it'll be their problem. I'm not around to deal with it. Um, asset protection is something we all should be thinking about right now. Um, we're, we're in very, very serious economic times. And those of us that do have assets are targets. We live in a very litigious society, in particular California has some laws that are very, in my opinion, promote a lot of litigation, and we need to make sure that if we do have equity in our home, it's protected. And a trust, different kinds of trust, but including a revocable living trust, can provide that protection. Before I talk about asset protection, I do want to talk about also taxes. We all have income tax. We get taxed on everything we make during life. We also have what's called estate taxes. We get taxed again at death, so the government always wants a piece of it. Right now, the law says we each have a lifetime exemption amount. What does that mean? A lifetime exemption amount is the amount we're able to pass the state ta without tax-free. Estate taxes are essentially death taxes, de taxes that happen at death. So we each have five million dollars of that lifetime exemption amount. Again, what does that mean? We're able to pass at death, or during life, $5 million each. So that's great. I mean, that's quite a few, uh, that's quite a bit of money. Unfortunately, this law is temporary. It ends in 2013. So January 1st, 2014, the law reverts back to what it was in the 90s. So plan when you die accordingly, because in 2014, <laughs> The exemption goes back to $1 million. Anything over that mark of $1 million is taxed at 55%. That's over 50 cents on every dollar that would be going to the government if you haven't put a plan in place to avoid this. And I should back up, currently I said it was $5 million, so everything over $5 million, it gets taxed at 35%, so it's a little better too. Um, and again, what is going to be taxed, it's going to be everything you own will be part of your estate. If it's over that $1 million mark in 2014, every cent gets taxed at 55%. So how does the revocable living trust help? One tax law that I haven't talked about yet is that between spouses, there's unlimited exemption. So you can pass to your spouse as much as you want, which is great. It wasn't always like that, and I don't think they'll change that law, but who knows what the government will do. But currently, and I don't see this changing in the future, we have unlimited amount that we pass to our spouse. So that's great. The problem is, if you don't have a trust in place to capture that first spouse who passes their exemption amount, it gets lost essentially passed, everything passed to the surviving spouse and they only get that one five million. So five million has been lost because you passed away and passed it to your spouse. So how does the trust solve that? It captures and says at that first passing, we're going to set up a second trust that we'll call, we'll call it the deceased spouse's trust. And their assets or half of the, basically the estate will go in that trust and that trust gets to grow and grow and grow and never be taxed at all. The government never gets to look at that again. The surviving spouse still gets access to that money, so they still get to use it for their well-being, being they're entitled to all the income on it. They can buy, sell, change, move it around as much as they want, but that money gets to grow and a big pot gets to be passed on that never gets taxed. So, a revocable living trust will capture that, um, that exemption. And instead of passing only five million in state tax free, you can pass 10. Or in 2014, instead of just one million, it's two million. So that's a huge added tax benefit that a lot of us don't know about and don't use, and we lose it. If you don't use it, you lose it. So now the rest of the time, I'd like to talk about um, asset protection planning. Because as I said, we do live in a society where people get named in lawsuits 
all the time, even though they're not even really involved and people see deep pockets, right? Um, a revocable living trust, while it being the most sort of simple and most basic type of trust, is actually going to provide a pretty good um, amount of, you know, of, of asset protection. Um, it's going to make it more difficult for creditors to go after the asset because it's held inside of trust, and a trust dictates when, how much, how you can get the assets inside the trust. So. We all know once we, a lawsuit is on the horizon, we can't move money around, right? That, that is considered a fraudulent transfer. But if we have assets already in a trust and we see some issue on the horizon potentially, we can do some things that will make it more difficult for people to go out of your, ass, out of your out, out, uh, after your assets. And that would be to name someone else as the trustee. Remember, the trustee is the person in charge of the trust. If it's not you, it could be someone else, a third-party advisor, that will be able to um, administer trust for you, but because you've given up a little bit of that control, a creditor can't tell you to, to, to give the money out of the trust or take the assets out of the trust. It makes it a lot harder for them to order them to do that. In fact, when you get sued and someone has a judgment against you, the um, creditor actually has to personally serve the trustee. And they'll have a heck of a time actually, A, getting the sheriff to do that because it has to, has to be served personally by the sheriff. And trying to get the sheriff's office to do anything is very difficult. And B, they have to find the trustee. And if it's not you, they're going to have a difficult time finding the trustee. Um, you can also change the, t the type of trust that it is uh, in general. Instead of what we call a revocable living trust, you can make it irrevocable. When we say revocable living trust, it means you can change at any time. When you make it irrevocable, the terms become frozen, and again, <laughs> it limits your ability to do things with the assets, which limits the ability of creditors to go after it. So, there are also other types of trust in general that help reduce taxes besides just a revocable living trust and protects your assets. Uh, those of you that are insurance professionals in this room today probably have heard of irrevocable life insurance trusts. As I talked about before, uh, your estate will be looked at upon your passing and everything, including life insurance, will be includable in the estate. However, if you put that life insurance policy in a type of trust, what we call an islet, it will not be taxed at all. And it will also be protected uh, from any creditors as well. Um, this is important because life insurance is a big, big part of how you provide for your family and leave them in a state. So not only are you providing them life insurance, but you're ensuring that it's estate tax free. There are also other types of irrevocable trusts, such as dynasty trusts. These are a great tool to pass on wealth from generation to generation to generation without any taxes at all. And again, because it's a type of irrevocable trust, it provides creditor protection. When I say irrevocable trust, people get kind of nervous because it means that you know things are sort of set, the terms are set. But just because it's irrevocable doesn't mean that you can't take assets in and out and exchange things. Doesn't mean you don't have access to the money. It just means that it's held within this trust. And it means that, again, the government can't look at it and creditors can't go after it. So these are a few different types of trust that will be really the crux or the core of an estate plan, which everyone needs. Other documents that will be included in the estate plan are what many of you have heard of are our will, but the will becomes less important. It's just called the pour over will, saying everything is supposed to go into my trust to avoid probate. And also very important documents, powers of attorney. I'm gonna briefly talk about those and then open up for questions. But a power of attorney is something that's important during your lifetime. It actually is invalid when you pass away. But it ensures, again, if something happens to you, the power of attorney for your health care matters. People in your family will know what your health care wishes are. So again, there's no confusion or fighting among family. And be power of attorney for asset management, which will ensure there's someone to pay your bills, 
take care of your finances, and it's someone you trust. And that's if you're just normal aging process, you get older and you need someone to manage non-trust assets, that person can access it by showing this document to the bank. Or if you're in some accident, someone can access the bank to make sure your medical bills are paid. Absent those documents in place, you're going to be stuck back in court. And a conservator shall have to be made and you, you don't want to, again, a lot of control is lost. Um, it also reduces the, the, the um, possibility of any financial abuse if you have, again, named someone that you, that you know will take care of you rather than it be open to anyone, which it could be if you don't have any document in place. Um, so those are the main documents that will be part of the estate plan. And there's a few others I haven't talked about today, but I did want to make sure I left enough time for questions because what I talk about is sort of detailed technically and legally, so I also encourage all of you to make sure that if you have questions, let me know. Um, as a realtor, there, you're going to come across issues when people are buying and selling land that they're going to be tax issues. And if you have a legal advisor that you can bring in, and I'm happy to help at any time in those kinds of situations, it makes you look like you have a good team that you're part of. So I'm always, at any time, willing to answer questions. And as an affiliate myself, I'm even more happy to do that for my fellow affiliates. So again, like I said, if, if we have time for questions, I'm we happy do. to do that. We do. Please move to the microphones. Uh, let me ask a question, if I may. But I understand that probate is, is horribly long right now. What's do you have any feel for that? What's going on with the courts? Um, it depends where you file. For example, um, I live in La Cunata, so I'm actually closest to Pasadena. But would I ever, if at all costs, file there? Absolutely not. It's a social club. People are more interested in, in socializing rather than getting business done. So I do try and file downtown. And that takes, I would say, a year and a half, maybe two years. So it's quite lengthy just because, um, as you know, with all the budget cuts, uh, there are less people in the government working, so people are not happy that, that are working, and there are a lot less of them to, to handle the paperwork. So. All right. No, no shortage of questions when it comes to free legal advice. <laughs> that, that is correct. Good morning. Uh, my name is Cesar Aviles with Cobo Bank and George Realty, and I have a question that is twofold. How often do you need to review your trust, and if there is a need at any point to kill the original and start from scratch on a, on a new trust? Sure. Um, I always invite my clients, uh, I bug them every year or two years, to come in and just chat with me, and it's always free. Um, I always encourage people that do have an existing trust, uh, if they're not my client, to have it reviewed. It's like going to the doctor if you're dealing with something serious, such as your assets. Uh, it's always good to get a second opinion, and I'm always willing to do that for people, and I don't charge for that. Um, so every two years, my clients do come in and we talk. Um, it's usually a change in circumstance. Um, for example, maybe a son was working at the business with the father. And he and his trust had actually left the business to the father and everything else, to, uh, son and everything else to the other kids. Meanwhile, that in the last few years, that business has been sold or the son took it over, and we need to change that and actually now divide everything equally among all the kids. So some life-changing event usually. Otherwise, like I said, I mean, if it's well drafted to begin with, it should expand, so to speak, and contract for all the different uh, events that might happen. You shouldn't. You should set it and forget it, but. Always get a second review just uh, by any attorney because you never know what that attorney might catch. And because I've reviewed thousands as a, a trust administrator, there's usually stuff that comes up. So, Hi, I'm Vanessa Carl Feldstein. Can you give us an example of a high profile person that didn't do any tax planning? They passed away and the government took most of the money. Um, the funniest one is actually. Um, <coughs> Well, Michael Jackson did do it, although he didn't really, um, I think he just had a will. So he didn't have a trust, so everything kind of became public, and we were all talking about what he did in his will, which I'm sure he'd rather have kept private, um, which I can believe that he really didn't have an estate plan. Another really funny one was actually, um, you're going to find this strange, um, Osama bin Laden. <laughs> they actually found his will after uh, he 
passed or whatever. And uh, yes. it really became public all his, his um, what he had decided to do too, which I'm sure he wouldn't have wanted either. I think it's a privacy issue um, that most of us would like to keep things private, especially if you are a high profile person. Another interesting example is um, in recent, um, he's been in the in Congress a lot speaking about this is Mickey Rooney, he's an actor. Um, he was actually, he did have a power of attorney in place, but he just, it wasn't well drafted and he really named the wrong person unfortunately and he was the subject of uh, literally held prisoner in his own home for a period of time where his stepson was in charge of his assets and not, um, he, he couldn't have access to them. So he finally got out of that position and has been an advocate for people to make sure they have these documents in place, but that you know, you've sat down with the attorney, you really discussed how broad or how narrow you want to make those powers and that you name the right person. And perhaps it's not just one person, this is a really important point, Perhaps it's two people that can need to confer with each other, and maybe one is a family member because you don't want to offend your family by leaving them out, but it, the second might be a trusted advisor like a neighbor or a bookkeeper or someone that provides that check, that sort of objective opinion. That helps really prevent a lot of family issues and, and abuse issues. Good morning, Mark Blue with Allstate Insurance. I have a couple of questions, but one is, Many of us might have our own businesses and our real estate holdings in various corporations yes. that are held under the whole trust. So if one of those entities are in litigation, does that expose the whole trust? No, because you've held each, um, this is very generally speaking, but if you've had each property for say, rental property, I'm a big proponent of having rental property in an LLC, why? Because if you are sued, First line of defense should be insurance. Second is you should be limited to that property rather than your other assets. So if you put in an LLC, which I do for a lot of my clients, but you have the one of the members of the LLC or the owner of the LLC essentially be the trust, that makes sure you're avoiding probate, but does not expose your other assets to liability. It's just help, part of it is held by the trust or assigned to the trust so that you're, you need to have that done so that you're avoiding probate. So it's great to have this business entity, but it needs to be encompassed by a trust, so we avoid probate, but at the same time, because it's held entity, you're not exposed to liability for your other assets. Okay. And just my follow-up question was, you indicated that as the trustee, it was, you advised that a third party be a part of that because of, of whatever happens, but what if our spouses are the trustee, would you advise when our spouses are living that we do get a third party? It's really, uh, not. that's not as common. Okay. This is when you're getting down to your, your children, maybe, because the great thing about having a trust is you have some asset protection during your life, but you also have it for your um, beneficiaries, so for your kids. So let's say you, you, you limit, you say, okay, at age 25, I want to get their stuff, otherwise they're getting everything at 18, which I don't recommend. Um, we try and encourage them, let's go to college, you can get distributions for the college, money for college, and then at 25, maybe you have the right to take out a third maybe a half, maybe another few years you get the rest. Um, but essentially, while they have that, what's called right of withdrawal, if they don't take that money, that money is protected from creditors. So you've also not only protected yourself while you're living, but you also made sure that your children are protected later on. Giuseppe Veneziano, International Real Estate Network. Uh, this is a two-pronged question um, regarding dynasty trusts. Yes. Uh, is there a maximum tax exemption amount on that? And if so, is there any way to protect the assets above that amount? Right. Um, I think what you're asking is how much can you put into it, essentially. Um, well, in the next year or two, we have a really great opportunity to do some, some transfer of assets into the type of trust like this up to each person that $5 million. So it's a great opportunity to stuff a lot in there to make sure it's getting to be estate tax-free and protected. Uh, without any incurring any taxes at all. If you go over that five million, you are going to incur what's called gift tax, which I did not talk about, but there will be some tax implications of going over that five million. But if you're a couple and you're doing one together or even two separately, you can put up to 10 million, so it's quite a bit that can get funneled into that trust in the next year or so um, without incurring taxes. Um, you can put more into that and they'll, it'll still be protected but you, when you funded it originally, you'll have to pay some taxes at that period of time. 
Esther Johnson with Don and Johnson Realty. I have two questions. Can you change a revocable trust to an irrevocable? It would depend. In general, yes, but each trust is drafted differently. So I don't, um, a revocable living trust means, but in general, you can change the terms at any time. So, but if it's existing and you're trying to work within the terms of the document, for the most part, I'm, I'm likely you could, but I don't hate to say that for every trust because I don't know what the terms of those trusts are. But in general, you, you likely could. Um, the other question is, if you have a power of attorney, when I die, the power of attorney dies. Exactly. True? So it's only affected while you're living, and it's going to apply essentially to um, to all the non-trust assets because the trust assets will be in the trust. The small bank accounts that you didn't put in the trust, because they're small, they're not going to trigger probate. Practically, it's difficult to put every account in the trust that you might open and close and checking, so it doesn't. Um, one thing about powers of attorney in general, because there are statutory forms, um, meaning the government uh, dictates what we should, how we should format it and, and how it, what it should include, uh, they do get outdated quite often and they become what I call stale or ineffective. And so some people do think that they are protected always by this. That's one thing, uh, kind of exception to the earlier um, comment I made about setting it aside and forgetting it. Those do should be updated a little more regularly, but it's very easy to do. So, any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excuse me, can I ask a question? Well, is it quick? <laughs> really quick. <laughs> All right. uh, when a person has power of attorney, and the uh, person dies, does that power of attorney uh, the uh, the powers that he had under the attorney, uh, power of attorney revert to the beneficiary uh, trustee? Can they merge? No, it's a separate thing, and once you've gone, that document's gone too. Okay, so uh, a person that wants the person that holds the uh, power of attorney is also the beneficiary trustee. This has to be two separate documents. Well, you would have that named in the trust, and then the trust lives on. Long, uh, much longer than you do, so beyond your passing, and that person can be in charge. So you name it in the trust. Thank you. Before you